through the carbonate, that's how I got free. Jump it back off because there's no stopping me. Postmodern player, sample tastic, flows it frastic. I get drastic. Hey, watch the plastic. Yo, I name check and leave you drastic. Welcome to the MacGuffin. I'm Spencer, and today I'm joined by the two stars of For a Good Time Call, Ari Grainer, Lauren Miller. Um, again, this is a I'm coining the term, even though it's not in Tech Week, Drew. Okay. Dramcom for this. Dramcom. Oh. It's it's more of a traditional comedy, but I'm going yeah. with Dramcom just because I want to coin a, a term. Okay. Um, about <laughs> uh, two. It's totally inaccurate, but okay. No, no, yeah, I'm know, just kidding. As, as I said, you know, <laughs> this is up. a very broad comedy. Yeah, no, just <laughs> uh, don't be misled. You guys play college enemies <laughs> who end up having to live together and then ultimately running a phone sex line. Uh, <laughs> Let's just start off by saying, how does one prepare for that? Like, that seems like kind of, A, a unique thing to write, and B, in terms of acting, like, I guess you just have to go for it. And you know, we just started a, a phone sex line in real life together during the shoot. Yeah, that would have been it, smart. It was, it yeah, was no, callers really we're still doing that. it, actually. My phone might ring <laughs> any second now. Um, you know, like, for us, this movie and 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 the um, genesis of writing it, too, is so much about friendship. That was kind mm -hmm. of the, the phone sex part is a really fun piece of it, and, and right. surely it's a major part of it. But, um, but so much of it is really about sort of – this love story of these two girls in a totally platonic sense and and um they're sort of finding themselves and and the phone sex piece for me i think some of the onus was taken off because you want to be funny over sexy mm -hmm. any day of the week so it's, it was more of a challenge to figure out like how do we write phone sex that makes sense being phone sex but without being overly sexual right. which is oddly like very difficult or something. yeah right yeah no our purpose was to entertain not to uh you know make anyone go like turn on yeah <laughs> that's my turn on face i mean it, it's sort of weird to me i mean obviously you know for a good time call definitely sort of plays into that idea but for me like i always think of the tommy two-tone song when i i uh Hear that phrase, Which you know, eight seven six five. Eight six seven five three zero nine. That's the thing yeah. that I always think of, and yeah. so it's like I see the title, and then I'm like, that. Oh, I, I mean, I guess yeah, phone sex. I guess. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> but, um, you know, this is this film's coming out in sort of a pro the post bridesmaids world. Uh, I'm sure you're going to get questioned about that a million times. But my question is sort of like. What is sort of your perception of that? Do you try and embrace it? Do you try and ignore it? I mean, it seems like an inevitable comparison because, you know, uh, it's a female-driven sort of raunchy comedy. Even though they're dramatically different mm -hmm. things, it seems right. like you're going to get lumped together. I mean, I think it's a huge honor to be compared to a movie like Bridesmaids, which we totally We're loved. Obsessed and, with, yeah. you know, it, it was amazing. And what Bridesmaids did was really open the door to these R-rated female comedies that, that weren't as, you know, were, weren't really getting made before Bridesmaids happened. Yeah. And so um, we're really psyched to, to have a comparison yeah. to a movie like Bridesmaids and just hope that this trend in movies continues and that, that women will continue to have really funny parts that are real and grounded. And, and I think also what you said is, you know, is really astute that they are dramatically different at the same time. That sort of the idea of like, oh, female comedies are getting made is so exciting. But at the same time, it's like saying, you know, any movie that has men in it, that they're all the same movie, you know, that right. it's like we know, too, that uh, that the movies are so uniquely in their own spirit. But just how wonderful to know and to prove to people, especially sort of in the studio world and in the sort of outside audience world, that women, there is a marketplace for women. And but it's sort of tough because, you know, that's sort of like Hollywood's M.O. is that everything yeah. has to be like something Lights else. Right. And like just because Bridesmaids was the recent hit, it's sort of like, eh, you know. You saw Bridesmaids last year. Right. Come see this. And right. sort of like, I, I mean, I, I definitely appreciate the element of, you know, embracing that movement. But at the same time, does that concern you to be? Because it's sort of like somebody who goes to see Bridesmaids, you say it's a very different film. Right. And like, hopefully right. doing this kind of thing, explain that difference. But, you know, somebody who sees like a tagline, oh, it's like Bridesmaids or something like that. And they're like, they go see it and they see it. And it's a very dramatically different film than Bridesmaids. I mean, there's right. a touching, you know, female relationship or whatever in both of them. But beyond that, like, it, it's sort of like, I wouldn't want it to negatively right. reflect on you just because you did something and then somebody completely separate from you associated those two films. Right. Well, I think that, you know, I think that once people, when people do see our movie, they will see that it is different. 
but yep. that it's also good and that it's also, you know, just as enjoyable and just as funny, I hope, yeah. if I don't say so myself. <laughs> and, um, you know, so I hope that what it does is really help to just continue and further in people's minds and in studios' minds that, like, women can be funny. It doesn't have to be about bridesmaids. It doesn't have to be about phone sex. It can be about something else. And women can be funny in, in a ton of different ways. And I hope that, you know, audiences, I think when they see the movie, will say, like, yeah, it was funny, and that's, that's you know, it's women being funny, and that's like bridesmaids, but that's where the comparison really ends. And well, and I think it's also the conversation is more about sort of getting people in the seats than, than the fear of movies being compared once they're in them. I mean, I think that's ultimately, besides just loving bridesmaids as a, as a great piece of entertainment, more of the conversation and why it's great for everybody at, without really a downside is that it's just about getting people in the seats. You know, for a movie like us, we shot this in 16 days for yeah, very little money. Nobody knows who we are. So if there's anyone that people can say about like, oh, this seems like a movie that so many people loved, just to get people in there is great. And then we really love this movie and feel confident confident about it. So I think that once, as Lauren said, once they see it, they'll they'll get what this is, you know. And how did you go about, you know, developing the chemistry in the movie between the two of you were you guys friends prior to this I mean it's, it seems like you know you think about sort of at least in Bridesmaids case you know you have Maya Rudolph and Kristen Wiig who had worked together at Saturday Night Live mm-hmm, for a long right. time and for a film that's being made in 16 days the chemistry between the two of you is kind of the central key to yeah. it working yeah. or not what did you thanks guys for do? saying we have good chemistry well, first of all um well we i mean katie and i when we wrote the script we had admired ari's work for a while so we we always sort of had her you know running around in our heads while we were writing and so this was early on in the process of getting the movie made so ari came on board eight months before we shot so it was i mean so we had a long time mm. to get to know each other spent a lot of time together and really sort of develop that yeah. and then i think you know, what's on screen really is like what happened on set, but I guess it's because we had the foundation of what we had. I mean, I think that's the thing, like in film, this, the idea of rehearsal is so important, not less so about sort of working every beat of a scene and more about the sense of safety and comfort, and comfort between yeah, people. Yeah. And, you know, as Lauren said, like I came on, you know, pretty, you know, right at the sort of beginning and then the three of us sort of brought Jamie on together and we were all sort of going through this experience together and um, and then we all, you know, sat at Lauren's dining room table every day for a month, the four of us, sometimes, you know, writing and working. Sometimes we'd all be writing emails separately, but just spending all this time together to go through the whole script and make it so tight and work through our character stuff and talk to each other and get to know each other and hang out. And I think that was like the most invaluable time not only because it just like completely bonded all of us and made us feel so safe and and have such a sort of a one a a collective vision about what we wanted to do but then when we were able to shoot we had that in place we could go there and kind of do what we had to do and already have that dynamic what was it like working with you know Nia Vertilos and uh, Mimi Rogers who have like histories of being like well-known and successful female comedic uh, actresses. Uh, Was that something that, you know, you had always wanted to do? Was it just the opportunity presented itself? Was it an amazing learning experience? It was, I mean, it was so great to have the two of them around. Both obviously bring so much to the table in such different ways. And Nia, um, Katie and I actually, a few months before we shot, had seen Nia get an award at something, and she told her story about how she was trying to be an actor, and no one would give her an audition. And so she wrote this script that was a play, and then she turned it into a movie and then that happened for her and so we were sitting in the audience watching her tell the story and we're like oh, that's what we're doing oh my god and so we we wrote her a letter and asked if I'm she sure be, she cried too if she would be in our movie and she so graciously accepted and then um Mimi, I want to say, came through our casting directors, and that was just so incredible. I mean, they look like twins. The first I mean. moment that like she walked into our our production <laughs> office or whatever, and she and I looked at each other like. <laughs> Are we actually mother and daughter? Because this is crazy. And she was just so fun to be around. A million amazing stories. It was and also amazing how supportive they were of all of us. Mm. Like that was, you know, there was no sense. It, it was just pure love, support, encouragement. Mm-hmm. And, and even though we had just met them, I, I felt like, 
I mean, maybe this is sort of my own projection of the situation, but it felt like they were just proud of us for doing what we totally, were doing, you know, yeah. and just were there to like, what do you girls want us to do? What we'll, can, do, it. Ha- we'll do it, you know, that's and awesome. that's so, yeah. so amazing. And what is it like, you know, transitioning from that uh, supporting actress category to a lead? I mean, is it, is, do you notice a difference between doing the two of them? Do you feel like you get to, I don't know, get to know your character better because you're on set all the time? Like, what, what is that experience like? And is it something, or were you the whole time, you know, when you're doing other roles thinking like, oh, I could do better than her? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you know, the irony is, is that oftentimes the supporting roles are actually more interesting characters, you know, a lot in in so many mainstream movies, kind of the, the leads are in some way the blander Mm -hmm. characters. Yeah. And so the color gets to come from the character. So I've loved so much every character I've ever, I've ever played and have worked with such amazing people. And I mean, they're definitely, it's, it's a different kind of journey when you get to be there every day and you get to really take a character from one place to another. You know, a lot of times when you're supporting somebody or you're playing sort of a best friend, your journey is about supporting the Mm -hmm. other character. You're, it's less of a full character arc in terms of how they change and what they go through and more of like serving the story and which, which can be satisfying in its own way. But there's something to be said about, really looking at a full, complete journey of a character and figuring out where they start and how they get to where they end up. I mean, you make a very interesting point, though, that, you know, a lot of times the supporting characters are more interesting than the the leads. (laughs) Now that you guys are leads, though, how do you sort of combat that issue and make, you know, your roles interesting? Maybe it's easier since you guys were writing the film, but it it seems like that could be... uh, a potential, I don't know, problem or... But I think you know. when I read the script, like, that's what was so incredible when Lauren and Katie sent me the script is that that it was so remarkable to read a movie that was so funny and so smart and had these two incredible women leads that both were so well-rounded with such, you know, senses of humor, such, such depth, such... Um, such surprise turns about who they were and that's what's so incredible about what they wrote yeah and I I think that as an actor I mean obviously there are certain situations if you have a writer that doesn't want you to do anything with the script then you know you just need to bring to the table what you can but I think you know as as comedians you often have the opportunity to improvise and bring ideas and you know hopefully you know filmmakers are 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 very collaborative, which is what we did, which I think is what really helped us to create these lead characters that were colorful and had depth instead of just the straight guy. And how challenging was it for you to get this project, you know, off the ground? I mean, you guys had a lot of good pieces all put together, but at the same time, you're all very young. Uh, for the most part, you know, there's not an easy thing like, oh, she was the lead in Alien or something that right. you can mm-hmm. sell. I mean, Bridesmaids was probably an exception to the rule of most female driven comedy raunchy comedies really being successful how how challenging was it to sort of be like let's let's do this thing and you know it's it's going to be worth your while to do it was um it was quite challenging um Katie and I actually wrote the script 3 years ago um and it went out wide to the town um uh this the winter before bridesmaids was shot even it wasn't even made yet, and so, so yeah. and well, no, 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 before I, bridesmaids, no, no, no. Bridesmaids, bridesmaids was written. Start many, up many a little years. rivalry, right? No, no, no. Yeah, and, Kristen um, Wigg, if you're listening to that. <laughs> oh no, no, we knew we knew about bridesmaids, but um, <laughs> yeah, we're gonna start some beef oh, with Kristen. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> it would be okay, Kristen. You hear that? We'll win, so it's fine. Oh no, I, th- I think this little rivalry will work. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and and the script was extremely well received in town and people really loved it but no one wanted to make it because mm. we were told that our rated female comedies didn't do well and there was not an audience for them and so so we tried and you know we 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 did try even though we were told that we kept pushing and pushing and to make it through that studio world and then it was just one day and it was sort of me as an actor because I was never going to act in it if it was made in the studio world and so it was yeah, just one day yeah. and I thought if this is going to happen as an actor I need to make it happen. Do it yourself. So we did it ourselves. And it was also so amazing when we took it to Sundance. You know, when we were working in this yeah. place, we obviously, you make something and you have big dreams for it. But at, at least for me, when we were shooting, like, I couldn't really think beyond shooting the movie. And we knew we wanted to submit it to Sundance. And 
just the whole process, you know, we're both, I was first time I had executive produced, first time Lauren produced, and the editing process and figuring out how to sort of make a movie work. And then, you know, all the steps along the way that were sort of so incredible that they have and like that we got into Sundance. That was amazing. Yeah, and then, gotta be gratifying. you know, when we had our, our screening, I, I got what I call birthday party syndrome which I get pretty much every time we show the movie, which is like, oh my God, what if no one's there? What if nobody likes it? Everybody hates me. Everyone hates us. And we went and it, it was just this incredible response and a standing ovation and this laughter. And I just was sitting in the theater crying. We all just looked at each other with this look like, oh my God, I can't it, believe. It was like truly one of the most phenomenal experiences of my, of life. my life. Yeah. And then to have focus by us, which of, you know, of, of studios, one of the only places that I looked at literally over the years. And we all sort of said yeah. this about saying like, oh, one day I want to be in their kind of movies and to have them be behind us is incredible. Oh, and, and now you guys go from, you know, birthday party syndrome to Scrooge McDuck syndrome, because I'm sure you guys are just rolling in the <laughs> We're dough. just rolling oh, in yeah. money. Yeah. We're just yeah, throwing you know, hundred dollar bills around basically. everywhere. Yeah. 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 Uh, so the film comes mm -hmm. out August 31st, August limited, 31st. I believe, yes. and then goes wider than that. Yeah. Okay. And in terms of you guys, where can people find out more information about you guys and, you know, Twitters, websites, Facebooks, whatever? And <laughs> well, we well, just joined Twitter. We we're, did. we're very excited about it. I'm at I am Lauren Miller. I'm at A Grainer. And then you can go to our Facebook page, which is For a Good Time Call on Facebook. For a Good Time Call movie. Oh, no, oh, that's the way. Well, the website, there's a website. I'll put it the, down here, whatever. Okay. okay. And then well, the website the is www.forgoodtimecallmovie.com. And that's yeah I mean so there's a lot of that stuff and you know we're both you know I'm gonna go be on Broadway yeah, in the that's fall what I was say. What's, what's, what's next I'm gonna how, go how do you go like from this what, what can you possibly do to top this I'm gonna go play a porn star on Broadway that <laughs> sounds like a joke but it's not and, <laughs> um, and I'm gonna have a front row seat <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah hopefully we'll keep making funny movies hopefully yeah. together yeah and Katie and I are writing and I'm doing a few little things that are too early to mention. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Ari and Lauren, and uh, check out more interviews at MacGuffinPodcast.com. Thank you. Fire tonight. Magneto can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Even Zod can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. It's tight. Don't even try to buy the size of the eyes. Mr. Spock can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The Wrath of Khan can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The board can